Hey everyone, my name is Michna Stojka, I'm a character 2D here at SideFX, and today we will go through the more technical animation side of the elephant scene that we showed in the Houdini 19 release video. In the first section on the technical animation side, we can go ahead and configure the skeleton for Ragdoll. Uh, as mentioned at the beginning, this, this project was basically built to illustrate the secondary motion features that we have in KinFX Houdini 19, so obviously Ragdoll is a fairly important bit of the whole setup. Uh, as we had our rigger, starting with the rig and our animator, starting with the actual block out of the animation, we can safely go ahead and use the skeleton that we already had for the elephant to set up the proper attributes and parameters for our ragdoll setup. So we see here on screen the couple of nodes that were used to configure this. Um, at the top we have the rig stash pose, which is our sort of classic rest transform storage, where we store the skeleton into this rest transform attribute, just so we can reference it later. For this particular case, it's not necessary, since we're not dealing with any animated streams, but later on when we actually implement the animation, it's going to come in very useful. Uh, next up, we're working with a rig mirror pose up here, which allows us to store the mirror PT attribute. So this computes the mirroring of the skeleton for us and stores it into an attribute on the points. And we're going to use this one specifically in the ragdoll collision shapes uh, Python state to allow us to configure the shapes a bit faster. And then on to the actual ragdoll setup proper. We have here first a configured joint sub. So let's go ahead and actually do this uh, on the side just to kind of give an idea on what the workflow is here. So first thing, we want to set the mode to Ragdoll because we're working with Ragdoll. We don't want to see all the other noise that we are not interested in for this particular example. We can go ahead and check the rest transform attribute because again, when we switch this within animated stream, uh, this will actually be important. Then first thing, uh, sort of going down the parameter list here, uh, let's have a look at our skeleton uh, orientation, our joint orientation. So we see where the, each joint is looking down the z-axis towards its child. And then the actual uh, up vector, so our twist, is the uh, y-axis. So we can set our rotation order to be z, y, and x. So we make sure we get proper alignment of the handle and the ragdoll itself will behave the proper way. Once this has been done, we can actually start and define our rotation limits that will be used for the ragdoll. Now this process itself is you know, fairly um, straightforward where we're using this handle here to define our limits on the, the three axes. So we're dealing with X, as you can see by the, the red bumps here. Y, the green ones, we're getting this uh, semi-sphere uh, formed between these two handles that shows us the, the area of rotation that the, the joint is allowed to rotate in. And then this one, the Z. So we can go ahead and configure these limits for all of our joints. Uh, Shift F, by the way, is what I'm pressing to uh, switch the handle orientation. Um, if our joint is rotated, uh, flipped, basically. Um, so yeah, we can go ahead to define each each limit for each of these joints. And once we have it done for the whole skeleton, it's a lot of back and forth, of course, because it, it it's fairly specific to the scene. You can get the, roughly the the basic limits set up and then once you start testing your ragdoll see which joints you would like to limit even further or perhaps they're too limited and then you should just loosen them up a little bit so it's a bit of back and forth until you get them properly uh, set up for your specific skeleton and scene once this has been configured as we see here we actually have uh, all the, the joints we're interested in so if you go into the state we see that most of our joints have rotation limits at this point uh, highlighted by this orange square around them the next node we want to drop down is our ragdoll collision shapes. So this one is to configure the what actual part of our skin will get simulated because obviously we, we don't want to simulate the whole skin because that's way too dense. So we want to define a pair of collision shapes around our skeleton to be sent to the ragdoll simulation to get the interaction and the physical interaction action that we were looking for. So I entered the state here on the node. Uh, we see a couple of options here, including this mirror attribute, which I mentioned at the beginning. We want to turn this on here, and also we can enable the mirror in the state parameters, which sets it in the HUD as well. So now we'll be able to get uh, easier manipulation of the, the shapes, which I'll show you in just a second. Uh, next up, we can select which joints we are actually interested in, because at the moment we see them all and can be a bit too noisy. So some of them, like for example, the fingertips here, 
who don't really need because they're not um, part of the skin. Well, they don't really influence the, the skinning process at all, so they're kind of out, outside the region we're interested in. Um, templating the skin is the way to go as well when you want to work with, with the shapes, so you want to make sure you scale them properly to fit your mesh. Uh, but before we go ahead and actually manipulate them, we can press S, the usual like Houdini selector, and start selecting the joints we want to use for our collision shapes. So I can just select a few here. I'm not going to select all of them as we already did that off camera on that node. So select the ones you want, then press enter, and that's going to get rid of all the other ones. So we get rid of the noise basically. And then we go back, display our skin. You see this? skin and the joints. And now if I come here and I click on a joint, you see we get two shapes. And because we have this mirror PT and the mirror in the state active, we can manipulate the this shape and its mirror counterpart at the same time, which should make things a bit faster to, to work with. And then it's up to scaling these shapes to fit the skin properly here. You can also, you know, rotate them a little bit, transform them in space just to get this, this nice, uh, alignment that you would be going for. Can do one more here. And so on and so forth. And this is basically the idea and the workflow of creating these shapes for the whole skeleton. Coming coming back down to this node here where we've configured the whole thing. When I fire the state we can see we've got them across the whole whole skin. Tail, trunk included, even the tusks here and they fit fairly well within the skin, the original skin. The next step here is our ragdoll constraints. So for this initial setup, there's nothing really that we have to do here, except enabling the configuration attribute. That's going to read this attribute here. So the limits are stored in the, this attribute. We can rename it if we wanted to. And then here we we'll have to make sure we enable this one. So actually read from it and set the, the proper limits for Ragdoll from that attribute. So once that's enabled, uh, we don't have to mess with any of those options, especially for this simple setup. You can, as you test the actual Ragdoll, come, come back here and tweak some of these parms just to get a, a di slightly different result if you're interested in this. But for this example, it wasn't necessary. And then last but not least, our Ragdoll solver, which takes all that we've configured upstream. We can come back, come down here to our uh, ground plane and create one just so we can test the results properly. Move it just a bit down. And now, yeah, we can run it and have a look at our our setup. Well, obviously in this case, we'll be getting a, a weird, let's show it in the joint form here. Bit of a weird solve since we're only configured shapes for our for our legs, for front legs here. But if we plug the main one, uh, in the stream and actually run the solve, we can see the whole elephant falling down. Then to the side, we can have a, a closer look at you know all the like legs, tails, all the joints, all the areas. See if any rotates more or less than we wanted to, and tweak them as we see necessary. This looks pretty solid, so I'm happy with the results. Um, and yeah, once here, we're pretty much ready to to plug in our first block out animation and to start thinking about how we actually want to make the scene run. Uh, before moving on to the next step though, one another bit of information that might be useful to, to check is under clip range here, where we define our animation clip range, so the length in frames. Uh, it's currently set to clip info detail attribute. Um, if you're not going to have a clip info on your animation, or e even if you're unsure what the clip info actually is, we can switch to the custom frame range come to this little list here and do a from clip info detail. And that's going to set the frame range to our clip info, which is, as we see, is one and two, not very, um, very long. So make sure that when you get your animation clip, you have a look at this first, um, because if there's no clip info, obviously the animation won't go through the ragdoll solver and you will not get any of the proper results. For this case, it works because we're not dealing with any animation, just a static pose that falls down. But if you want to just be sure, you can set this to the frame range, the scene range, 
for this particular scene should be fine or just make sure you have a clip info on the input animation that you're transferring over when running the ragdoll sim. So this has been the first part of our technical animation section. We got the ragdoll attributes and uh, all that stuff configured and now we're ready to move on to actually taking the block out animation from the animator and look at the secondary motion sub for setting up some of that ear, trunk and tail motion.